Welcome to the talk show called Allowed to Talk. And today on the show, I'm going to continue reading from the book I wrote called Who Took My Self-Esteem? Inner Critics Are Like Trolls. I'm going to try to finish the book up in the next three shows because it's been hard for me to read. But I want just, if one person is helped by the way I was healed and feel much better and know the truth of why I felt so bad as an adult, like I was nobody and nothing, worthless, no self-worth. Um, I just want to get this read, though, and I'm going to try to read like two to three, four chapters at a time to finish up the book. And um, I hope you enjoy it and learn something from it and that it helps anyone, someone, just one person. Going to, I'm going to continue reading chapter eight. Who took my self-esteem? Chapter eight. Parental rejection. Just hearing the words from my parents, such as, what is wrong with you, will make any child feel rejected. Words can be like used like a weapon. And the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me, is a lie. Whenever I heard children saying this little ditty, I would whip my head in the direction I heard it being sung and wonder why they believe that is the truth. In my teenage years, my hormones were raging. Sometimes the shorts and tops I wore were not up to my mother's liking. She liked the clothing the flying nun wore, I guess. I was walking past the living room to go out for the night. I was going to pick up two of my friends for a trip to the local food hangout. Two of my girlfriends. As I walked by the doorway of our living room, my mom yelled out, You are dressed like a hussy! She did this loud and obnoxiously without batting an eye. No kind words or asking me to come into the room to talk to me nicely. Just yelling out that I was dressed like a hussy. I looked the word up in the dictionary. To this day, I have a phobia about dressing like a hussy. My parents never told me about my menstrual period or anything about the birds and the bees. When my raging hormones were overtaking me, I thought I was a freak when certain things touching my breasts felt good. The only thing I remember my parents educating me on was this. Brush your teeth every night or they will rot out of your mouth. I never vacuumed correctly in their eyes. I could not even wind up the vacuum cord right. When I cleaned our bedroom, no one showed me anything. I piled the huge mass of dirty laundry on our bedroom floor into the closet. I truly thought I did an okay job cleaning. Boy, was I wrong every time and with every room I thought I cleaned. There was never an outfit laying out for me on the bed to wear for the next day for school or church or anything. I quite often wore an outfit for days on end in the summer and stockings until they almost stood up by themselves. I remember putting socks on for school with a certain stench. When I pulled them onto my feet, a mist of dried sweat puffed out from the socks. One time my sister cut my hair and I cut her hair. A sister that was a year and a half, four months older than me. I say a year and a half sometimes. My mom asked, what happened to you? She told everyone one about how we got scissors and cut her hair like it was something horrible. One time she was screaming that somebody did something and she wanted to know who it was. I said, well, I am nobody, so if somebody did it, then it wasn't me. She never understood what I was trying to tell her. She just kept questioning all of us in the kitchen as to who would have done such a thing. It wasn't me, that I know. And if you are asking somebody, then since I am nobody, that leaves me out. Sad to say... But when I was in a car accident in 10th grade, my life improved somewhat afterward. I was going to the homecoming dance with a guy I met in study hall. A drunk driver ran the stop sign near an intersection we were traveling past. He slammed. The drunk driver slammed in the right side of the car I was riding in. I flew from the back seat to the front windshield where my face hit the rearview mirror. A concussion and 18 stitches to put my right eyelid back on. And I was in the hospital. Required a week in the hospital. If you, ever, if you look closer, if you're seeing my videos, you'll see my one eye is messed up. And um, I was in 10th grade when this happened. 
and 18 stitches across my right eyelid to put my right eyelid back on required a week in the hospital. The eyelid was like pulled off in a V shape. It didn't totally come off and fly away. It was just like torn in the V shape and just hanging there. I never made it to that dance in 10th grade. Okay, and this is how I got my car when I got a car. The insurance settlement paid $1,200 and my brother Bob helped me to buy a candy apple red Ford. I could now drive myself to cheering practice and not have to hear the belittling and berating from my dad. I am sure he was snowballing his anger onto me. My mom was boss and it was her way or the highway or insanity in my dad's case. Just trying to make light of that, seriously. My family of origin was definitely dysfunctional. Just what happened to me when I caught my sister in the bathroom necking with my older sister's husband gives that away. The sneaky meetings were going on for months. She babysat for them. My sister that was a year and four months older babysat for them. I got to babysit for the, the sister whose husband was a toxic drinker who came home drunk and threw his kids against the wall, hit them. When he was sober, he did not remember doing any of those things. He believed he was a wonderful father and husband. Laugh out loud. Because he was a wonderful father and husband. While I was in the hospital with stitches and a concussion, my sister is getting a Studebaker car painted purple. When she wrecked that car, no injuries, thank God, my older sister's husband got her a white Pontiac convertible car. During this sneaking around time, she would tell me in a mean tone that she was going away with her friends. I was the rejected sister many, many times. Everyone fears, everyone fears rejection and being rejected hurts. After I was discharged from the hospital, my mom did try to validate me more. I was 14 years old then, better late than never. Youth for Christ was taking a trip to Florida to attend a park for their grand opening. My mother gave me some cash for that trip. I was ecstatic. I sometimes was given money for gas in my red Ford when I took her shopping or to work. And that trip to Florida was a blast. I, I wrote about that, I think, in one of my other books. And now I'm on chapter nine. Chapter nine, you are too much. I never had any privacy growing up. I was in the bathtub when my oldest brother stormed into the bathroom to scold me for fighting with his oldest daughter. We were only two years apart. I'm two years older than her. There was a curtain for a door on that only bathroom that we all shared. The folding door was installed years later. When I was sent along with his family, I was told that I took up too much room in the back seat of his car. I was told that by his oldest daughter the most. I would have to hear about how this was their dad's car and I shouldn't be taking so much room. I shouldn't be taking up so much room. After I was shot for being the messenger of bad news about my sister and my brother-in-law, my mom decided to have a few rooms built on the house since she rented it from my grandparents, her parents. She talked to her parents and they approved to build on to the farmhouse we lived in. After the addition was finished, she had a new dining room, two new bathrooms, and three new bedrooms. Somehow I was left in the old bedroom upstairs and my older sister that's a year and four months older than me got the new room off the new dining room. When I talked to my other sisters about this, when I talked to my other sister about this, she defended the choice for precious sister saying, she is older than you, so she should get the new room. You are too much. Going back a few years, when I was four years old, I was babysat by my mother's parents. My pap was busy farming, and my grandma was busy sewing. One day, in fact, well, she sewed all the wedding dresses except one for the double wedding that my two sisters had. That's in another book I wrote. One day, my pap took his heart pill and left the bottle on the kitchen table. When I climbed on a chair and wanted some of his candy, because I thought it was candy, he, immediate, he immediately, my pap immediately put the bottle on the third shelf above the kitchen sink. After, gra well, pap went out to farm, and then after grandma went in the sewing room and pap went out to the front door to farm, I pulled a kitchen chair up to the sink. I climbed onto the chair and then onto the sink counter and then up to the third shelf. I soon swallowed all the candy, all of his heart pills. Within a few minutes, my grandma was yelling 
that I should have not eaten my pap's heart pills. I must not have been given much candy since I downed those pills. The doctor was called and he was on his way to check on me when I threw up all of the pills. I remember laying on my grandparents' day bed in the living room and being scolded and told how bad I am for eating those pills. But I do not remember any consoling or hug or words of how glad they were that I was going to be okay. The simple, am the, excuse me, the simple answer for this was that my grandparents were not watching me close enough that day. No big deal, really. Human error happens all the time. Lives are lost because of human error, and that is devastating. But stuff happens. What blows my mind is the fact that they were having none of the responsibility for what happened to me. I was just labeled bad. The bad, 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 bad child. I don't have that typed down, but I just added that. Also, at age four, I tried to walk home from a store after I believed that my sisters left me there alone. I didn't know they walked away from me into another row, two rows over to the shampoo row or conditioner is what they told me later. I was twirling a red comic book display looking at the comic books. Remember, I was age four. They kept shopping. When I looked up at, a few minutes later, they were gone. At age four, I believed they were far away and gone. When I walked outside and passed the parking lot, I had no idea that I could have looked for the car. I, I just didn't think of looking for the car at age four. I didn't even know where we parked, actually. To me, there were many more vehicles parked in that lot, and looking for a car never crossed my mind. At age four, I took a ride at the end of the parking lot and walked towards the direction of where we lived in the farmhouse. I was about halfway home when a light blue car pulled over just in front of where I was walking. A very beautiful red-haired woman stepped out of the front of the car. I usually ran from strangers, but I stopped and stood there, frozen. She asked me, what is a tiny little girl like you doing walking along this busy road by yourself? And I didn't answer. She scooped me up into her arms and put me in the front seat right between her and the driver, a man which I assume was her husband. I sat closer to the angelic lady. lady. I sat closer, excuse me, to the, I sat closer to the angelic lady as we drove off. Just up the road, I saw a house my cousin Frank lived at, and I yelled out his name as we drove by. The gentleman, actually we called him Butch, so I was yelling, Butch, Butch, excuse me, that was his nickname. The gentleman driving turned around and parked at my cousin's house. When she took me to their door, my Aunt Alma asked, answer the door, and Aunt Alma said, how did you get my niece? And the lady explained, the angelic lady and her husband left me at my aunt's house. My Aunt Alma called my grandmother's house to let her know what had happened to me. My grandma came to Aunt Alma's house and drove me straight back to that store. Big mistake for a four-year-old to take him way back to that store because that traumatized me. That trauma stayed with me for a very long time. My mother did not even come along to pick me up. I know my mom was at home because when I left with my sisters to go to the store, my mom gave them permission to take me along after they convinced her I would be fine. Grandma pulled back into that big parking lot at the store where there was a black and white police car parked. Apparently, the store called the police or one of my sisters when they were frantically looking for me. If they would have kept an eye on me, this never would have happened in the first place. My sisters were crying great big tears, and I was confused by that. I looked to the left and saw them all standing there crying. As I stood on the front seat of my grandma's car, the policeman stuck his head in the window and scolded at me for running away and repeatedly told me how bad I am. You will never run away from your family again, he said boldly. I was traumatized. Meanwhile, the three sisters continued their deep sorrow and crying big tears just to the left of my grandma's car. No hugs or words of endearment to me, such as you, we, such as we are so glad you are okay. <clears throat> Never were those told to me that I'm, they didn't even for once say, I'm glad you're fine, that you didn't, maybe years and years later, but not then, not even one second did they hug me and say, I'm glad you're okay. My grandma didn't, my mom didn't, my sisters didn't. What I did hear that day and for years and years to come were the words, these words, you are bad, 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 and you ran away from us just like someone was trying to convince themselves that 
was that was really the truth because I was walking home because I thought I was left by my sisters. Positive, kind words were not part of my family of origins vocabulary. Their quick, easy way to get me to shut up was to shoot me down by telling me how bad I was and still am. Every time I was hoping for some compassion, I was told about how worse other kids and other people have it. I was bullied at school and on jobs, and I did not know how to defend myself. I would fawn and run away from conflict. I quit jobs after bullies would have the upper hand in the workplace. I did not know how to keep boundaries and defend the truth. In, in school, kids bullied me, took my toys in the schoolyard, and destroyed them. My show-and-tell black-haired troll doll was stolen, and my Thumbelina doll had its arms ripped off, and the teacher just shrugged their shoulders and had excuses. No nice comments saying they are sorry that happened. In third grade, a girl named Miriam took my homework right out of my book and erased my name and printed her name on it and handed it in. The teacher wasn't in the room, of course. She had gone to the office or something. I was later put in the hallway for lying when I told the teacher that Miriam did this. And you know what some of my sisters would say about this? Oh, poor you. Everyone picks on you. Do you know how good you have it? Stop complaining. Grow up. You have no real reason to complain over this. Chapter 10. Run wild like an animal. There are times when I was left to run free around the farm. Every time my grandparents butchered cattle, butchered their cattle or hogs, I would be left to run free like a wild animal. I was only about four years old when I first saw the cattle being shot. I also saw chickens get their heads chopped off. The chicken would be attached by the feet to a long chain. The chain was hanging from a large tree behind the area where they did the cleaning of the meat. Butchering was something that had to be done to put meat on the table. What never should have been allowed is for a small child to wander free to watch the butchering take place. Small children should be kept behind the scenes where they can play or stay inside and color or decorate cookies or something. Besides the inner critical voices in my mind from my mother, I can still see and remember vividly the shot ringing out, the hog or cattle being drugged over to the huge trough of hot steaming fluid, probably hot water. They would lower the animal into the trough and proceed to clean the hair off the meat with large circular scrapers. One time while they were butchering, I was walking around the farm area in the lane, and I was running around the area where most people park their vehicles when I, right under that old cherry tree, to my delight, there was a huge wad of ABC gum, already been chewed gum. I picked it right up and shoved it in my tiny mouth. The one place I always ended up was on the back porch with one or several of my cats. I was made fun of for having, I was made fun of for having that outlet at times. One of my sisters used to tell me that I think I am a cat. I never talked back to her about that. In fact, I rarely said much about most things said about me in, and in my childhood. What did they expect me to do when I had very little nurturing, approval, or validation from them? I used italics for the words very little because I did have some of those things. I remember having two of my older sisters around for a bit. They had work and their own lives to live. Own lives to live. Between dating and work, they really didn't have time to give me the amount of the above nurturing and validation that I needed so much. My older sister, a year and a half older than me, had the oldest sister still around when she was very tiny. Life isn't fair, but that is not what this book is about. It is about how your family of origin can intentionally and unintentionally take your self-esteem. As an adult searching for it, a toxic manipulator just might try to suck the life out of you also. My sister that's a year and a half older than me turned to my Uncle Amar and his wife Sarah for some nurturing. She spent a lot of time over at his house with his adopted daughter Patsy. His wife was pregnant from another man when he married her, and that's all in my other book, The Gray Book. I was not allowed to sleep over because of my accidents. I peed in bed, so I couldn't stay in anyone's house usually. I was the sister that seemed to have cooties when it came to my older sister that's a year and a half older playing with me. This went on in our early teenage years, too, when she dated her own brother-in-law when she was 16 years old. My mom's sister, my mom's sister, Peg, or Margaret, Aunt Peg, could not have children. She offered to adopt my one brother. 
I think my mom, way down deep, was very hurt by this offer, but she never said a word to prove that. My one older sister said that mom stopped going to church for a bit after that, for about a year, and this was during my infancy. Go figure. When Aunt Peg would fly or drive back to our hometown to visit every summer, we would have a family play for her. She had her husband... She and her husband moved to California for his work many years before I understood why she moved there. My older sibling started a club called the Fip, the Flip Flop Club, and our cousin Patsy would supply all the costumes from her dance recitals. Lucky her that she had costumes from her dance recitals. This one year, the club planned to have a play that would be about a wedding. The pretty long white dress that used to fit Patsy and my sister that's a year and a half older than me did not fit them this year. It was too small for them. It was tried on me, and it fit me perfectly. One of my older sisters, I'm not sure which one, but I think I know which one. One of my older sisters said, well, we want it. My, the older sister, that's this year and a half older than me, to play the bride. But since it fits Kay, we are going to have to let her be the bride. This kind of talk was what was handed out to me a lot. That statement cut to the heart. But what did I say back to her? You guessed it. Nothing. I'll start with chapter 11 when I read it again. Hope you're having a great day and that as you learn something and realize there is such a thing as post-traumatic stress, complex post-traumatic stress, that, and that you can heal from it and that you will be abused by narcissistic people, that maybe you will learn something from this book and heal. I hope you're having a great day. Take care.